right, Alicia. How are you doing? Welcome back to another Hello. immigration Q&A. Nice to be here. Well, everyone, it looks like we're still in PNP land and uh, we have had the privilege of seeing another massive PNP draw. So for those of you who is, you know, who are a little bit concerned about what your what the future holds, there's only so many people in Canada right now. And when they're doing these PNP draws, large amounts, and as they continue to issue those, um, one of the questions we get more often than any right now in this current state of affairs, especially you outlanders who are looking to apply through FSW, is it, is it the end? Is, you know, are there going to be any draws anymore? You know, are they going to completely scrap the FSW? No, <laughs> no, they're not. But we know that's, you know, we know what's happening. We know what you guys are thinking because... You book consults and we see it every single day. The worries, the concerns, you students that are, um, you know, on your postgrads and they're running out and any day we're waiting for an announcement from the minister to do something. Those of you, and I can't remember which club it was, he appeared before the minister. Um, I don't know, Alicia, if you saw that notification, but um, some of our okay. colleagues, um, uh, he, he uh, spoke at a recent engagement that he had and reiterated once again that the intention is not to pause the express entry process indefinitely and when you look at the levels plans which i've shared my my own thoughts on it i personally think that there's room in there for things to happen a lot sooner than people expect and i just had a consult alicia with someone who um, had filed their pnp application they got their acknowledgement of receipt i think in I think it was June or July of 2021 and they were outside from India and they received, um, actually, no, it was a, their, their medical had expired. They received a remedical request, but the AOR was the beginning of, of, um, 2021 and, uh, and they've got their passport. Um, the passport request is, is virtually on its way, which is under a year. So yeah. there was a lot of fanfare, fanfare made about the 20 plus pro months of processing. And um, so we'll, we'll just have to see how this plays out. But I think they're going to call, I think they're going to get through this backlog fast. Personally. Yeah, I had another client who had booked a consult uh, reach out to me and just say, thank you so much for your help. I just wanted to let you know that I just got my passport request. So they are starting to move. And that's, I, that's really good news for everyone else because once they're through those backlogs, then they're going to be in a position to start extending those invitations. And remember, you guys, it takes them time to actually get you here. So, you know, you've got 60 days to file your EAPR even when you get an ITA. And if they were to get back down to regular processing times, that's another six months. So there's eight months. And then it takes time for you to figure out you know, how to wrap up your affairs and move to Canada, which then can be, you know, any for up to four months if we're just going by the date of the uh, original medical. So you're almost a year from start to finish throughout that process anyways. And so we can see that they're going to, they're going to expand back up to 70 plus thousand in 2023. And, you know, even more back up over a hundred thousand in 2024. So um, those of you who are wondering, is there going to be anything happening this year? Absolutely, there is. And there may be other adjustments that the minister makes. He may add in occupation-specific bonus points with an express entry or things like that. But um, although we were hoping that the, the federal high-skilled category in those annual levels plans would have remained up, you know, in the 80,000s where it was before, um, that wasn't the case because they needed to carve out space for all the TR-to-PR pathways. But I believe that they've landed some from last year. And they've got, you know, 80,000 or whatever, or 70,000 that are attributed for 22 and 2023. So there may even be room for the minister to, to do another, you know, smaller kind of, uh, you know, essential worker program. But it's speculation, but we'll just have to see how it plays out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had a few consults this last week of people, and I really feel for them who are postgrads, they've finished their degree in Canada. And most of the time, well, some of them actually, it's heartbreaking because they only had an eight month program. And now they're stuck because to try to get into another program, 
you can't just do a short-term program and a lot of the schools aren't opening up the May intake um, or it's already closed for international students. And so some of them are scrambling to try to find something and they were going to look at a six month program. And I said, don't do it because you no. can't, you cannot stack Canadian education for a six month program. You have to have both programs have to be at least eight months in duration. But the problem is a timing problem because yeah. you can't have a big gap either. You have to be able to finish both of those two programs within two years in order to get the full two year eligibility, which right. means that you're eligible for that three year postgrad. Three year. Mm -hmm. So just be really careful, guys, if you're if your status is running out and you're trying to figure out what to do, your study permit or your postgrad work permit, like because in some circumstances you don't want to apply for that postgrad work permit if you can actually extend your education. Maybe you transfer educational institutions and you're able to get your first courses credited towards your larger degree. So please book a consult if you're in situations like this so that we can talk through all the ramifications and get the full details about your case. Yeah, exactly. And I will just pull up a few comments here. We'll say hello to a few people. Always, when you tune in, post where you're tuning in from. We'd love to see where uh, this live stream is, is actually being viewed. Okay, let's do some adjustments here. This one is a little bit bigger than we need it to be. So we'll adjust that one. So there's uh, Shaman. Good to see you. Uh, we've got Liz who's tuning in from Moscow. That's awesome. Um, and Kyle is wrong because FSWs are not going to be extinct soon. <laughs> but I understand people's fears because people love to, to say the sky is falling, right? That's chicken little, right? That's, uh, you know, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. And that's what people want to say. But clearly, we're in a little bit of a, a, a blip here that is causing the government to have to make some adjustments and changes. And, and you know, it's having negative imp impacts on people. But ultimately, um, there is definitely a future for FSW. All right. Amy says, good morning, Mark and Alicia. Hello from not in Canada. Oh, well, I can't remember, um, Amy, where you are connected in, connecting in from. I can't remember. Okay. <clears throat> um Okay, Ocean sent in love from India, Bangalore. Bangalore. So it, it's actually, what is it, about 11.45 p.m. there in, in Bangalore. So thanks for connecting in. Um, and then we've got Ms. Fox here. Hail from Halley. <laughs> See you, Halifax. See you in class tonight. We'll rewatch tonight before class going back to work. All right, sounds good. Thanks for tuning in. So one of the... Uh, one of the students that's currently attending, Alicia, the Express Entry Masterclass right here that we've got going on. And I've said repeatedly, this group is actually really, really cool. They're, they're awesome. So thanks for connecting in there, um, Ms. Fox. All right. So if, lots of people are posting questions already. So just hang, off, hang, hang on just for a little bit, and then we'll make sure that we get to those. We just want to give some shout outs. It looks like everybody just wants questions. They don't want to <laughs> connect in. Marwan from Libya. Hey, we haven't had someone from Libya for a while. Good to see you back, Marwan. And uh, yeah, and then Thesura, absolutely, regular follower. Uh, Aisha is here. You're very welcome. Trying to keep people updated. Um, okay, let's see what else we have here. We'll go a couple more. Uh, and then um, let's see what we have here. We've got TD who's in Toronto. And uh, we've got um, we've got Chris. He's in Peru. This is great. And then Yaroslavna, good to see you. Look at this. This is the thing that makes me the happiest. Do you see that little symbol on there, Alicia? Mm -hmm. Yaroslavna is watching on LinkedIn. So I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if this was going to be able to connect in. I've had issues with this. And, uh, but I'm so glad, Yaroslavna, that you're able to connect in. And don't hesitate to ask some questions. And uh, I believe you're Slavin. I think you work in a law firm, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember from your profile. So thank you for your support. Uh, Brenda's tuning in from Jamaica and uh, Budika is in Richmond Hill. Great. Uh, um, Dr. Harkapur is in Punjab, India. And uh, Patel, hello to you as well. Um, <laughs> I love you guys are awesome. You guys are like a family, really. You guys are. So yeah, we don't need any neg negative energy, Kyle. Do we, Sarah? <laughs> we don't need any negative energy. So <laughs> thanks, Sarah. Okay. Oh, you're Slavin. Yes, you're in Winnipeg. Exactly. 
And uh, yes, so that was great. And thank you for the referral as well. So I think I'm going to be meeting with uh, the f- person you referred to me this afternoon, I believe. So thank you for that. And uh, legit 90s back again from Cambridge. Um, uh, we've got Starbucks girl. I can't even remember. I don't think you've ever really told me your name, but that's great. So from over from Toronto, Deshesh is over in beautiful BC. Um, uh, Limitless Lusari Cario is Montreal, Quebec. And David's over in Hamilton. And uh, Kieran, good to see you down in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Leonard, uh, Leonard, okay. Leonard is tuning in from Facebook and he is here in Alberta. You have to let us know where in Alberta you're from. And Deval, good to see you. Um, let's see what else we have here. We're just about to the bottom. We got Hosea is Namibia and Jama is from South Africa. The nice South African flags. Fantastic. And let's see. And then we've got, uh, Joban is Punjab as well. And Ifo is Nairobi, Kenya. So there we go. We've done a ton of shout outs. So it's really neat to see where everybody's tuning in from. So thanks for connecting. And Leonard's up in White Court. That's right, Leonard. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, Alicia, I don't know if you have anything to share before we jump into, uh, uh, before we actually jump into the, the live Q&A session, but how has the week been for you so far? Well, I can, I can feel people panicking. I can feel people panicking about, especially if they're in Canada and their status is expiring. So I've had a few consults about that. Actually, I think at least four consults about that just recently. And so sometimes there are things that can be done, right? Depending on what your score is, what your profile is, what your language scores are, um, you might have room, right? You might be able to find a little bit of extra space if you can get those points for French, right? If you've been studying French. Or I had another client who has retained us for express entry review and she had a fantastic score. She's a native French speaker. She's got her TEF results and she said, oh my gosh, I'm worried about the score. Should I take my English exam? For sure, take your English exam because if that's going to bump you up and get you those extra 10 points or who knows how many you can get depending on how you do on your English exams, that's bonus, right? So there's some things that that maybe can be done. And that's, you know, you make a good point because some people, what I've seen over the last, well, when was the last no program specified draw? I think it was around December 23rd of 2020. And some people have just kind of sat back and said, oh, you know what? They haven't done anything to try to improve their situation other than just, you know, in in, in fairness, some people, there's nothing they can do. They just have to watch sadly as they have a birthday and and lose points. But for in other cases, people have tried proactively to, to do things to increase their chances like learning French or writing the language test or trying to improve their language scores. Um, There's no doubt that it's super, super competitive, but um, anything you can do to give yourself even a slightly more, um, you know, put yourself in a more advantageous position, you want to do that, right? And Um, I have a caveat, though. I have a caveat because the caveat is I can see people panicking to the extent that they're maybe fudging things, right? Mm -hmm. And you cannot do that. So uh, another thing that people have been saying as well you know what, I'm at the end of my studies, I'm, I'm at the end of my postgrad work permit, I have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, do I get married, right? But now if you've got a really healthy CRS score and you're looking at getting married and you've only been together for a little bit of time and honestly, immigration is going to get concerned about marriages of convenience. So it is not a genuine marriage if at the time of the marriage it's entered into for immigration purposes. So be really, really careful not to throw your chances at PR away because you're panicking, you're desperate, and you're doing something that could jeopardize, you know, the genuineness of your immigration application. So do whatever you can that's that's legitimate, where you can get points, but you have to be honest and you got to be genuine and make sure that you're looking long term and not just, you know, maybe you go back, maybe you do go back for three months and maybe there's a draw in the summer and, and maybe that all works out just fine. But um, hopefully that you've got somebody to talk to about your options. So at least you understand what the options are and make sure not to rush into anything and panic about it. Yeah. That's great advice. 
I'll, I will pull Graydon back up here. So Graydon's here in Lethbridge. Um, Graydon worked with um, one of the settlement organizations here in Lethbridge, and he's an immigration consultant now. So big shout out to you, Graydon. Um, I hear you've got some big ventures planned yourself. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, Kunmar is in, in Chandigarh, and uh, what we'll do here is we're just going to pull up the first question here. So the first one from Joe, he says, do you guys have a link or article on how to tackle or catch the Chinook system for student application? Watched your vid with Will, it was helpful. So Joe, follow them. So the first thing that I'll tell you, Will and LJ and their Imlights podcast, which is they've got the website for it. I'm going to pull this up for you guys so you can see it. Um, you'll see that it's it should be linked in that video that I did. And I promote the heck out of those guys because they're doing some great work. And uh, let's see if I can find it. But they're, they're not as far advanced as I am in terms of, of getting the message out. And I'll, I'll show you why I say that. So you can see here, you every one of you that's watching this need to go over here and subscribe to, to Will and LJ's podcast here. And they, uh, especially this last one, two months ago that they did, um, we did an update. So Will and I did an update on mine. But wow, there's only 888 people that have watched this. This is a this one right here is a very, very important one that you don't want to miss. Um, Mario Blissimo joined them, Alicia, and talked about Chinook, talked about the use of augmented whatever you want to call it, you know, yeah. processing and, and through the use of artificial intelligence. So head over there to that M light of all circumstances. <laughs> Maybe it's the name, I don't know. But anyways, um, this is this is one that you guys will want to to connect with and follow through with. And obviously, uh, Joe, when we're going through this and as we learn more, we're going to be releasing things all the time. Well, I the have, other thing. Oh, yeah, please. Oh, Go I was just going to say, to add to that, I promised you guys last week I was going to write an article on the top reasons that study permits get refused. And I said top five, and I thought maybe I could do top five, and then I started writing it. And it became top six and then seven and then so it's top 10 now and it's a big long article but we've got to get it posted to our website so yeah. that will also help because there are common themes in terms of refusals also yeah exactly i'm just going to take a peek i know that igor was working on getting that one uh, released and uh, he is into full law school mode here so not quite yet um, hopefully we will get that up shortly all right i'm just going to shrink this down a little bit and just that people know, a lot of these resources that Alicia is talking about are right here on our firm website. And all you have to do is go to resources and then blog, and it will pull it up. And even this one right here, if you haven't come to the site and read Alicia's blog here, you need to, especially if you're an international student, you know, on that postgrad work permit, wondering what your options are. Um, but one option is, uh, sorry, one option that isn't that isn't there for you is to just sit and do nothing, let your permit expire, stay in Canada legally and hope that something's going to change. That is one option that you do not want to follow. And, uh, you know, obviously you can book a consult with any of us and, uh, and uh, get, you know, direction and advice on how best to move forward, given your own, you know, specific circumstances. Okay, we'll, add, we'll get one more here. So this one, um, uh, Chuan says, okay, AOR, January 2021. Okay, Outland, India. File is moved from NDVO to Ottawa. Status, criminality passed, rest pending, upfront medicals, recommended or not. Well, I can tell you that with the global network, right, Alicia, they can move your file anywhere they want to. And when it comes to processing, um, we've seen a number of them actually get shifted to Winnipeg. And uh, I've had a a number of uh, individuals mentioned that their file has been moved to, to Winnipeg for processing. And Winnipeg, Manitoba, has never traditionally been a, a place where they process PR applications. But with the global network, it's actually advantageous because they can shift files to the locations where they have more capacity, right? Yeah. So okay. whether upfront medicals are recommended or not, sure, if you are able to go do those medicals if you've got a designated medical practitioner near you and you want to make sure that that file is moved along as quickly as possible and they don't have to stop and ask you for medicals within 30 days then if you want to do that you can for sure do that yeah, yeah and i have been telling people to do that more often if the panel physician is willing to cooperate and do it then yeah 
Okay. Uh, all right, David, let's see what he says here. So this, this is also, yeah, been reported in, in the media. So just watch CBC News interview with Sean Fraser. He mentioned about expand pathway to temporary worker and international students. Do you think new public policy would come this year? Okay, I'm going to just pull this up, Alicia, because it's, it's worth, it's worth uh, kind of talking about. So one of the things, if you, you know, there's a lot of sources, and I have in the past been fairly, you know, um, positive towards CIC News. They are putting out some good, uh, the Campbell Cohen's firm, they are uh, putting, and actually I don't even know if it's Campbell Cohen anymore or if it's just, um, if they've changed. Uh, but anyways, after David's passing, but, um, but these news releases that we see here, um, this is where, you know, obviously the government spin on things. But CBC, if they're pushing out articles, someone has heard the minister say things. I repeat what I heard right here, guys, in my own ear from the minister himself. Um, but when you go down here, and let's just pull this up, modernization, that's not the one we're looking for. Uh, this one here, the levels plan. So let's just pull this up for a second. And I'm also going to, I'm just going to make this even smaller. Um, Okay, so you can see here that these federal economic public policies, this is, you guys, this is the TR to PR pathways, okay? And so they expect that all admissions will end by 2023, and that's fine. But if you look here, you'll see that they have allocated, and I'm going to slide this over just a little bit because it's um, one of the challenges with the way they've set this up there. Then we can see, have a little bit bigger picture here. When you look at the federal economic public policies, 40,000 is the target for here, but there is a high mark of 48 that they potentially could go to. 32 is their target, but there's actually another high water mark. I wonder if I can kind of cheat it here. Oh, I can, hooray. Um, a high, high water mark here of up to 42,000. So you guys can do the math. And if we were to go back, which I'm not going to for the 2021, they landed TR to PR pathways in 2021. So of the, what was it, Alicia, close to 90,000 or however many they allocated for last year, um, there's many of them that were landed last year. And uh, so that weren't a part of this quota. So when I look at this, there is potentially some room for the minister to wiggle because even if they're saying some of the TR to PR pathways, maybe the bulk of them are going to be landed this year. And that could potentially leave room open for another program that would leave spots for international students for next year. And we don't know uh, exactly what the minister's got planned, but, but the reality is these are designed outside of the federal high-skilled category, which includes the traditional, you know, FSW, the skilled trades, and CEC. So I just wanted to point that out because um, lots of people, once again, the sky is falling, right? But like David says here, the minister has always been very, very proactive um, with uh, reiterating that no, FSW is not dead. But hey, it's fear and fear mongering, people get better news reports and they get better reach on their, their, their news when we talk about the sky, sky is falling. So we got we to gotta combat that with the love, right? We do. Absolutely. We need to. Okay, infinite RB beats. Is it normal for not getting AOR after linking an application for more than one month? I applied under the TR to PR, stream B, no AOR, and updates. Got biometric refund letter twice. Hmm. So, a month. What do you think, Alicia? Oh, my. I mean, a lot of people are still waiting for the TR to PR AOR, and I don't think it is affected by the fact that you linked or, you know, like you're, it's still waiting. I don't think it's going to be um, a problem that you haven't got that AOR yet because they may stretch this for quite a while, depending on where they've shifted their processing priorities. So uh, I'm not sure about biometric refund letter. Maybe you've already done biometrics and then you had to pay and get a refund, or maybe you mean request letter. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not exactly certain on that one either. Okay. Um... Ephraim's from Ethiopia. If I see some new people popping in, I'll pull them up. Um, okay. And then we've got some people that are just goofy. I'm going to ignore them. Actually, I'll give Kyle a shout out. Kyle is an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So I'll give you your last little shining light and then everybody else can point out Kyle is an idiot. All right. Well, but you know what? You know what's interesting? I did have a consult with a client who, because of the timing of things, had a passport expire. So the passport Uh expired. Then he had to apply for the recapture of time. So he was on his postgrad work permit. He did the recapture of time application. But at the same time, the public policy came out on that 18 month extension in order to get, you know, an added 18 months. And so what happened was, this is what this is what the client told me. He said, uh-huh. I actually got my postgrad, well, I got a work permit for five years in total. Well, it was a little bit less than five years. It was three years plus the 18 months. Because what yeah. happened when he did that is he quoted the whole public policy. So he did the recapture of time, but because of the timing, they also had the 18 months. So they tacked on the 18 months and they, they just did. put it all on that one passport or okay. sorry, work permit. So okay, then, it's not technically a five-year PGWP, <laughs> but maybe what happened, it could be, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, okay. Kyle. I'll retract calling Kyle an idiot because it sounded like Kyle was just doing stuff just to irritate people. And so if you really did, Kyle and Alicia, you, you're you aware of that, then, well, understand that that is, it's, it's not a true five-year post-grad, but if you're able to benefit, then more power to you. Okay, I'm not thanks, saying Alicia. it was Kyle. But I'm just saying it's theoretically, it could be possible if they combine the public policy with a recapture of time. All right. Okay. Alina says, hey, Mark and Alicia, thanks for all these live sessions. It's great. Um, do you think IRCC will extend the work permit policy under tr to pr until 2023? So we've, we've, we've talked about this at, ad nauseum, but what is, what do you think? I certainly would hope so, right? If they're going to be processing these applications under TR to PR until 2023, potentially, then hopefully they'll extend the ability to work in the meantime. Um, But hopefully by then people would have AOR. So I don't know. I, I really hope that they are, the minister is going to be issuing something to help the people who have no fault of their own through no fault of their own. They don't have that bridge right now. Uh, Manasi says, just in case the new pathway for international students is open, what should we be ready with in terms of documents, except IELTS, which of course was the pain and suffering of many people, PCCs or any other documents required? Yeah. Well, make sure you have your transcripts too. So I would say a lot of people, they maybe just have the language exam results and they just have the education credential assessment, but sometimes they forget that they have to go get their transcripts. And sometimes it's hard to get your transcripts depending on which educational institution you went to. And if it's not in English or French, you've got to also get a certified translation of those documents. So that's something for students that I would recommend that you take the time to do now ahead of time. So you're not scrambling later. I agree. Uh, Nishant, he's asking, when is it going to be ready? Well, my friend, wow, that's amazing. You've got your remedicals passed February the 14th, three days ago. When will they send the passport request? I, I personally think it will be under a month, Nishant. Um, obviously, I'm not sure exactly where you're at. You're probably, maybe you're in India, I'm not sure. But um, I would have to assume that if you've got everything to them, um, and it was, yeah, three days ago, I've seen that it's been about a month. It could be even faster. That's my, that's my prediction here. Okay. Come back and let us know, Nishant. Exactly. Okay. Ami says, uh, okay, FSW Outland, AOR September of 2020. Asked this in December. Deferred it to wait for passport request. Is it still okay to pursue a master's in the U.S.? IRCC is taking eternity for EE candidates. Ah. Uh, you know, September 2020, like you're, you've got to be, you've got to be getting close um, at this stage with the rate at which they're processing these. And so do you start a master's program in the U.S.? Well, theoretically you can, right? There's nothing stopping you. You could do a soft landing uh, if you're, you know, if you, the passport request is received, you could do a soft landing now and then go back and finish school. So it, it's possible if that's something that you want to do. Um, any thoughts, Alicia, on that one? Yeah, I mean, just, well, uh, look carefully at the university or college's 
guidelines and fine print on your fees for that education because some of them will require those fees up front. Maybe your tuition is gone if you decide to change or withdraw from the program. See if there's any possibility that you could transfer um, those credits that you're earning. But keep in mind that you've got your permanent residency obligation. So if you do do a soft landing and you're outside of Canada for more than the initial three years, you're likely going to lose your PR. So just be really careful that if you do a soft landing, you are very carefully tracking all your days in and out of Canada. Of course, now the new tracking system between Canada and the US, they know. They know everything now. Everything. So you keep good records yourself, but make sure that you have within at least those first three years that you've gained enough days in Canada that it's possible for you to meet the 730 days within the first five year period. Perfect. Okay. All right. And it uh, looks like someone good has taken our advice here and subscribed to their channel. So great. Definitely those videos are good ones. Okay. Um, let's see here. Patel. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right, come on. <laughs> All right, so asking you about the I'm the, the stepping Alberta. stool for Simba. <laughs> I'm the stepping stool. And then I'm going to... Patel's asking <laughs> about the Alberta Express entry. <laughs> And he submitted his application December 6, 2021, but he hasn't gotten a reply yet. So processing time of Alberta PNP. So we did a whole, a whole little live stream on Alberta PNP programs. And one of the things that's a fun and interesting fact from the Alberta PNP website is they have a huge disclaimer on there and they say, you know what? Just because you submit an application doesn't mean we're going to look at it, doesn't mean we're going to respond to you. We have no obligation basically to do anything, but if we get back to you, then consider yourself lucky kind of deal. So yep. I don't think it's necessarily a problem that they haven't responded to you. Keep in mind that there's two streams under the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program. There's the kind of the old paper-based is what it's called, or the older processing AOS. Alberta Opportunity Stream, and then there's the Alberta Express Entry AINP Stream. So, and it's this one right here. So, yeah. And if you look at this within the Alberta Express Entry Stream, there is now a new accelerated tech pathway, depending on whether you have a certain NOC that's on the list and whether your employer has a certain NAICS code also on the list. Yeah. And that was about uh, a week ago that we did that one. Okay. All right, let's keep cruising down here. Um, so Ifo says, hey, Mark and Alicia, when will the visa office outside Canada be open like Nairobi, Kenya? Mm, yes. Uh, Africa. Africa. Uh, it, this that? is hard. I mean, immigration has a certain number of staff, and they're going to move their staff around and open offices depending on country conditions and a whole bunch of other factors. And for sure there are slowdowns in certain areas where there's a massive influx of applications um, and it's hard to say when they're going to open it yeah it's um you know i think all of us are about ready now for this pandemic to be over and we're all keeping our fingers crossed that it's going to continue to get better and better and better and largely that's that's what we're seeing with a lot of the visa offices in Africa. Um, it's significantly delayed their ability to reopen. And, you know, let's be honest, like some countries have been able to get vaccines a lot easier than others. And, um, and literally some continents, right? And so it's, it's, yeah, we understand the frustrations. We do, we, we hear it from our clients all the time. So, um, yeah, when is it going to open? That is a crystal ball that unfortunately Alicia and I are not able to, to look into. But if there is positive movement and we see things moving forward, Aoife, we'll make sure uh, that we, we let everybody know. All right. Okay, let's get to this one from Sonny. He says, <laughs> hi, my favorite lawyers. Well, thank you. <laughs> Maybe we're the only ones that he knows, Alicia. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm an FSW Outlander, AOR January uh, of 2020, I'm assuming. Remeds and ADRs passed last month. Everything passed and final decision pending as per call center agent. 
those call center agents must be just, they shifted from the Afghan crisis. Now it's to the FSW outland crisis. And uh, as per the call, is there anything I can do uh, to, I'm assuming to kind of move it forward? Um, at this stage, no, you're in that queue. You know, things are moving forward. But remember, you guys, if you're coming from India, for instance, over 30%, what is it, 33, 34% of all the 34. landings in the last year recently um, have been from Indian nationals through express entry. So um, when you have a limited, you know, limited sources for processing and especially outlanders, if it's got to go through the consulate in India, um, then it's, you know, you, you're just going to have to wait as they work through everyone's, especially if there's everything's good to go. Um, you know, except for obviously the final decision, but, uh, but yeah, so hang in there. Okay. Um, and, and just on that, Mark, these, yeah, please. I did see that statistic and it said for, for permanent residence applications, but it probably is also going to include spouses and sponsorships and stuff like yeah, that too. That's I'm guessing. Fair. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's fair. Okay. Let's see here. I've got another one. We'll pull up and make sure that you put your comment if you can in the chat. Okay, in the super chat. Okay, so post-grad work permit expires June 25th. Should I still wait for a CEC draw or a possible public policy or explore PNP options? And the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So for us, I hope you read my article, that one on what, you know, how long can I stay in Canada after my work permit expires? But if you do have a PNP option and you know that, you know, that's the school that you've gone to, you've got ties to that province and you have a realistic chance of being eligible for one of those programs, then great. Look at your PNP options for sure. Um, this article is going to go through a bunch of other things that you might want to consider. Um, things to check out right away. Make sure your documents aren't expiring. Make sure your passport's going to be valid. You know, make sure that you know exactly what day your work permit expires. Is there a possibility that you have an employer who might be willing to support you on a closed or open work permit? I've got some more details there on what the differences are and how employers can do that. Um, is there a way that you can do a bridging application? Make sure that you know that you have to leave by the time that your document expires or you're going to be, de be doing another application. So you might be maintaining your status by, I don't know if it's possible to switch to a different study permit program in your case, or maybe you decide to switch to a visitor visa application or maybe you decide that you're going to go home and wait it out. It, it really depends on your CRS score as well. So you guys can see, do you see how much time Alicia puts into this? This is unbelievable. This isn't some fluff that gives you high level things that you need to do to, you know, not really know what to do, but just be afraid of or scared. <laughs> this is why this button here should be your absolute next click after you read this. Thank you, Alicia, for writing that. That was an awesome, awesome blog post. Okay, I've got one more here. I'm going to pull up. Um, let's see here. Okay. Let's see if we can get to another spot. Um, this is a kind of a tough one here. How long can it take for criminality check? depends if you've got anything in your criminal history. It also sometimes depends on if you share the same name or birthday of somebody else who has something in their criminal history. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that might be completely out of your control. But do be really, really careful here. I see so many people who do not read or choose not to read the question properly on their express entry application, their section, you know, their schedule A1669 form or 5669 form where it says, have you ever been charged with any criminal offense in any country? It also asks whether you have ever been detained, arrested, or put in jail. And yeah. so even if you have had an expungement or an absolute discharge or a pardon for a criminal offense, or you overturned it on appeal, if you were ever arrested or if you were in handcuffs, or you were in the back of a police car, or if you ever spent time at a police facility, you have to say yes to have you ever been arrested, detained, or put in jail. Otherwise, it is absolutely misrep, and you're in 
big trouble because it's probably going to be a five-year inadmissibility bar. So as long as that's not your situation, as long as they're just doing the background criminality checks, it depends on how long it's going to take them to assign it to an officer as well. And this one from Shane kind of carries over into this. So what is involved in security screening? Is it random? Uh, can an officer pass the security or he has to refer it to another IRCC partner? Maybe mm -hmm. you can shed just a, a little bit of light, although, you know, it's a fairly black box, you guys. We, we don't, you know, we don't know all of the ins and outs as to, as to how they do it, but maybe what are some thoughts you have on that, Alicia? Yeah, so they're going to run a name and birthday check for sure. And this is another thing that sometimes crops up is sometimes some countries, I know India, for example, they don't issue birth certificates all the time, or maybe they don't issue a birth certificate until the person's quite a bit older. Or maybe there's a problem on that document and there's a different name and birthday. You've got to declare all variations of your name. The forms are going to say, have you ever used another name? And so if you've used another name, they're going to check both names. If you fail to declare another name, then they can say it prevents them from doing their security and background checks. So be really careful about that. You have a positive obligation to declare any names that you have used. They're going to run name and birthday, and then they're probably going to also run some information checks with their partners. So depending on which country of nationality you are from, there's information sharing agreements between Canada and other countries. Um, they will also look to see if you are on a list. So they have Interpol and other organizations have lists of people that they have flagged, um, usually based on biometrics, sometimes name and birthday. So if that's happening, that's going to be a problem um, if you happen to be on one of these lists. But the other thing is they will look at your country of origin, <clears throat> pardon me, and nationality, and they will look to see if you've done military, his, military service as well or if you were in a country where there was armed combat. And so those are all things that they will look at if the circumstances warrant it. I wanted to post this because I now have verifiable proof that Kyle is not an idiot. And based on the feedback that you've provided, I think Mark is the idiot. And uh, now we've got that clarified. So thanks for, for sharing that. Okay, let's zip over here. So this uh, menu says is that they have 465 points and we get a lot of these, Alicia. 465, I'm in the pool. How much does a score should I have to be on the safe side for this year and the express entry draw? So this is where we're, we're looking into that crystal ball and we're saying, okay, is, you know, how, what is going to be enough to, to get that ITA? And this is where we're making educated guesses. And maybe, Mark, you can pull up the pool and we can just take a look at that express entry pool and see how many people are sitting where right now. And of course, the caveat with this is as soon as they open up these pools, more people are going to rush in. So this is only a snapshot in time. But this is as of, I guess, two days ago now. Yeah. Um, yeah. The we've 15th, got. And then the draw was the 16th. And we know that 1,000 invitations were issued. For 710 and up so we take that into consideration so obviously they flushed all of these out anyone above 600 had to have had a nomination well generally i guess maybe there's a way you could hit 600 points i guess if you had french and everything else and canadian work experience but um but for the most part it's a pnp nomination and um yeah so 1099 are out there and yeah 5,000 so are at the 500 level. Yeah. And then if we break it down to 490s, there's still 2,000 there. 480s, another 6,000. And then this is the big one that people have to look at. 471, there's almost 15,000 people in that spot. And generally yeah. speaking, this is really almost people with perfect human capital scores. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they've got a PhD. Maybe they have three years of work experience. Maybe they're still 29 years old even. I, I don't know how you do that. but um, And they've got maximum language scores like CLB 10 across the board. Um, so if you're sitting at 465, you're in the band before or underneath all those other people. Yeah. And we know from previous rounds of invitations that it hasn't gone down below 468 
for an eternity. Like we're talking back to probably 20, 2018, maybe 2017. Did it get down that low? Um, and so 468, I think, was the last draw um, that happened. If we go back to uh, the last no program specified draw, this one, 170. If we look at that one, the score dropped down to 468. And then before then, yeah, it has, it, like it hadn't been that low below 470 for a very, very long time. And so, um, yeah, it's, what do you, what do you say? It's been, it's been interesting. Uh, if you look at all of the draws, how far back, 469, 469, 468, and then we go further, you can see it was always above 470 and the no program specified draws, yeah, I don't even remember how far back. It was CECs that were lower, but right. everything else, everything else, um, it just, I don't even remember. So here, I guess 464, we hit here. Um, and then that 464, let's flip over here. Yeah, that was October the 2nd, 2019. So it's, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it will ever get back to that level, because since then we've added French, right? We've added other right. other sources of points. And even when they added siblings to the mix, that added, you know, that affected scores as well. So not yeah. easy, not easy at all. Okay. I'm it sure also depends. Are, oh, yeah. Go ahead. It also depends, Vinu, if you have any CEC eligibility, right? Or if you're just a FSW yeah. eligible. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, good point. That's a good point. Okay, Cypher says, uh, trying to apply for BC PNP Tech. Can you guide on what to expect on the processing timelines I should be expecting? Um, I can kind of jump in on here. And, you know, speaking with some of the recent colleagues, like the BC is turning these things around very quickly, like, you know, almost six weeks or, or less in some instances. So the, um, especially with tech, they tend to be uh, um, a, quite a bit quicker. Alberta is getting better for sure. Uh, but BC's kind of got this down. And so it's, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if it was, if it was less than two months, Cypher. I don't know, Alicia, if you have any extra And they do have, that. yeah. So they do have a little bit of information on the BC PNP website. So they normally say that the average decision is between two to three months, or it was last time I checked, I think a couple of weeks ago. So take a look, see what they say on their website, but they try to be transparent in their processing of how long it'll take for their provincial time. Yeah, so they still say two to three months. Yeah, so that's the skills immigration and express entry BC. Uh, so about two to three months and entrepreneur. So yeah. yeah, so that's kind of the general little overview there. Okay, uh, let's see here. Let's pull up another one. All right, so this one says, can we expect CEC resuming before May? Postgrad expiring, or can postgrad work permit extensions, will they be allowed again? Should I wait? Well, what's the alternative? I'm not sure what else you can do at this stage than wait. But 470, no way for PNP, will CEC resume before no specified draws? Yeah. My guess would be probably CEC will resume, resume before no program specified draws, but um, it, it it's hard to say. It's hard to say about what immigration is going to do to try to get that backlog down, how quickly, how quickly they will be able to clear it. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily wait if you have other options. So take a look to see what else you might be able to do in the meantime. Hmm. Never check your your messages while you're on the live stream. Um, it has not been a good week. My, my friend just informed me that his father passed away. So Aww. this is, this is, it was a blessing for him um, because he was suffering from a number of things, bone cancer, everything else. But wow, it's, you know, I think everybody's been through a lot through this stretch. And I think the thing that helps us to keep going is knowing that there is a brighter day ahead. This, this, dark cloud that's over express entry, this dark cloud that everybody is suffering through when their work permits are expiring, there is going to be a brighter day. I am optimistic that the minister is going to, one, expand that post-grad work permit uh, 
policy to allow for another extension of time. And I think there's a very good chance that he'll do something else in terms of programs. So I'm going to take that position. And based on the discussions I've had personally with him, as well as what we've seen him say in recent um, you know, speeches that he has made to various organizations. And so I'm going to remain optimistic. I'm going to remain positive. And I'm going to continue to tell people to hang in there. Hang in there. Read Alicia's blog. It will at least give you the information that you need. If you need to book a consult to help plan things out, do that. But we are here to help and support you. And the moment I hear anything, trust me, I will, I will announce it. I will 100% create a course to workshop as many people as we possibly can. And we'll be here as a firm to support you as well through this. So stay positive, hang in there. This will, yeah. this will work out. And Sankini, I mean, I was wrong. I, I was hoping that there would be draws yeah. by February 14th, but there haven't been. And I said there hasn't January. been another I know. <laughs> I was there worse. hasn't been another program announced. It's it is disheartening, right? Because people are at the at the point now where they're gonna lose status. And I just hope that the minister knows that yeah. it's down to crunch time now. Yeah. So it's um He knows. That's I can. That's one thing I can reiterate to everyone that he is very, very well of this, where well aware of the situation. So, okay. So Anna here says I got an ecoper through the TR to PR pathway. My CAC application is still in process. Should I withdraw the application, or IRCC closes the application automatically? So she's hmm. got her landing through the TR to PR. And what do you recommend with CEC? Well, I mean, you can update. A web form inquiry, I guess, and say I got my landing, and yeah. I mean they should close that. They they won't allow two parallel landings to actually happen. But mm -hmm. you know you can notify them because things might be a little bit messy right now, and they may not have linked up the files. Yeah, and that's one thing that we see a lot of you guys. So if you're in Canada, you came in and you were issued a UCI, a unique client identification number. But in your express entry process, if you didn't identify that UCI number in your matter, it's not easy for the officer to link it. It's the UCI number that allows all of your immigration history to be linked to one profile. When I mean a profile, I mean an internal record of you as an individual within the immigration's GCMS system. So it's very possible that, you know, when you obviously applied through the TR to PR pathway, maybe there wasn't, you know, you didn't connect your UCI numbers with the two, and um, it does just take time. If you've just recently got your eCoper, then it's it's just going to take time for them to realize, oh, now we're ready to move forward with CEC. Oh, this person's already landed, so we don't need to proceed forward. But if you want to just send a web form, Anna, and just preempt it like Alicia said, um, that'll work. Yeah, that'll work just fine. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Anupriya says AOR once again all these individuals AOR May 2020 biometrics updated in February so we're talking this month um radio silence since oh February Still, 2021 uh sorry February 2021 oh thank you um so biometrics updated February 2021 radio silence since is it possible to keep this FSW updated uh updated marital running side by side with new spousal sponsorship does one end on submission of another okay fsw aor there's nothing stopping you from having two of those in the queue at the same time so that's the first thing i'll point out so ultimately if you have a spousal and it's working its way through its through the course you know whichever wins can win um, you just can't have two sponsorships at the same time if you're a sponsor uh, that's prohibited, but having multiple applications in the queue is not. So, um, you know, one doesn't necessarily trump another, but whichever, like we said here, whichever gets through first, you know, that would be the winner, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> and, and an officer might, other. yeah, an officer might force you to choose at a certain yeah. point. Yeah. Um, but then that's a good problem to have. It is. Absolutely, it is. Okay, we got one more and we're just into overtime now. And I, I have to take a quick peek myself and make sure. Nope, it's just lunch here. So <laughs> so let's let's get to the next question. This one is uh okay. Uh uh Manvinderjit says, uh I am 34, currently in Canada on a study permit, enrolled in an eight-month 
Okay, eight month post grad certificate. Um, my plan is to go for a one year post grad to get a one year of experience for CEC. Okay, that probably still works. Um, but considering the current IRCC updates regarding express entry, would you advise that I go for another course to get a three year post grad? That's actually, yes. <laughs> that's actually. Oh, you can't even hear the applause. I think that's the question of the day right there. Yeah. I'll give them another one right here. There we go. <clears throat> that's a great question. I think both of us agree. Yes is what we would do. Can you explain yeah. why, Alicia, we would say that? And this is what I was just briefly referring to at the very beginning when we just started um, our live stream Q&A today was I had another consult with a very similar situation. So in that case, they were only doing an eight month course and their choice was, well, do I apply for the postgrad work permit now? But the problem is if you apply for the postgrad work permit now, it's one and done, guys. Once you apply and it gets used up, you can't ever apply for another postgrad. So when people are talking about postgrad extensions, it's not really a postgrad extension, what they did last year. It was a public policy to extend people who had had valid postgrad work permits for another 18 months on an open work permit. But be really clear, it's not a postgrad work permit extension. So what you could do though, and take a look at the website, if you look at the IRCC program manual, it'll talk about postgrad work permit validity. So you want to look at the validity period and you are not eligible to get more than eight months. If it's eight months, you get an eight month postgrad. If it's one year, you get a one year postgrad. If you have two years of school, you get a three year postgrad. So if there's any way that you can transfer programs to get into a full two year program, that would be ideal. Or you might have to try to stack courses, do another course that's at least going to be eight months in duration to at least get 16 months. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great, great advice. All right, guys, what is that I hear in the background? Oh, there's some music coming up. Here. Thank you so much for joining in today. We're going to wrap this one up. Thank you to Alicia for some more excellent, excellent information on immigration. It's been an absolute pleasure. Another week has passed us by. Next week, Alicia and I are going to have a special live Q&A that's devoted to anyone looking at applying to study in Canada. And this one is... So I want you guys to head right over, right over here. And if you have not yet, subscribe to the channel and watch as you're going through this process here just like we have our live here there will be a post as soon as we hit we get it posted here um, for you to get notified when we do that video so stay tuned for that and uh, it was great having everybody join us good luck everybody we'll let you know the moment that we hear anything on these things that are stressing everybody out thanks so much alicia thanks mark